Today we'll be looking at the specimen of the head. In front of me I have a sagittal section of the head and the neck. A sagittal section is when the head is cut from the center and divided into right and left halves. So what you are looking at right now is the right half of a head and neck. The thing about this specimen is that there are a number of features to point out and it's an excellent specimen for spotting. But if you were to divide into different parts, let us start with the top side. As you can see, the cranial cavity is exposed. The cranium which normally covers the head has been removed. Even the brain and the brain stem, you can see the entirety of the cranial cavity. If I were to show it to you like this. This right here is the ospital bone. And you can see how this is forming the cerebellar fossa. This point right over here is the internal ospital protuberance and on the outside you have the external ospital protuberance. This is the point where you have the confluence of sinuses, where all the venous sinuses meet up here. Aside from that, if you go up further, you can even appreciate the petrous part of the temporal bone. And there's an opening right over here for the internal acoustic meatus right over here this is where you have the passage of the facial nerve and as well as the vestibulocochlear nerve because here is where the inner ear rests if you remove the petrous part of the temporal bone you would be able to appreciate that the outside is where you have the temporal part the squamous part of the temporal bone over here is the foramen magnum. You can see some fibers of the spinal cord are cut and exposed here. Even the certain vessels can be appreciated coming up above. Here you have one of the vertebral arteries passing next by and here is the spinal cord. Going up front, here we have the middle cranial fossa. In the middle cranial fossa, the entirety is made by the spinoid bone. Here is the greater wing of the spinoid and up above we have the lesser wing of the spinoid. This is the Celica tertica where the pituitary gland rests. In front you can even appreciate the spinoid air sinus exposed. Here down below that is the pharynx. We'll get to that after passing the entirety of the cranial cavity. In the anterior cranial fossa where you have the orbital plates. The orbital plate have been exposed and you can see the orbital cavity with the muscles and nerves shown here. One easy muscle to appreciate here is the superior rectus uh, muscle and other ones down below. Here you even have, can appreciate one fiber of the ophthalmic nerve. All of these are passing through a common tendinous ring and through the superior orbital fissure. Having that said, if you were to look at the side view now, now we can come down and appreciate the rest of the pharynx, nasal cavity, and here is the nasal septum. The nasal septum is usually composed of multiple parts, but beyond that, if you were to see behind, this cavity exposed right over here, on the inside, this are where your nasal cavities are. Obviously the one I'm passing my needle through is the right nasal cavity. The left nasal cavity is located over here in the other half. If we go further back, you can see right over here, and I'm going to basically just pull this open so you can appreciate this thing more easily. And I'm passing a needle right through the opening of the eustachian tube. This is the opening of the eustachian tube, also known as the pharyngotympanic tube. This is what connects the middle ear with the backside of the pharynx and the nasal cavity. And you can see right behind it, if I were to use another pin, this elevation right here, this elevation is known as the torus tubaris. It is due to the prominence of the cartilaginous part of the eustachian tube. And the space right behind that, if you use a different pin, let's use a yellow one. On the back side, you can see a recess. This entirety of the recess is simply known as the pharyngeal recess. A pocket-like space located directly behind the torus tubaris. Going even further, 
If I were to descend downwards, then I notice that from the torus to baris, there's a bit of a fold here. This fold, which reads all the way to the pharynx, is known as the salpingopharyngeal fold. The salpingopharyngeal fold is made by, obviously, the salpingopharyngeus muscle. And then we finally come to this region. Now, in this specimen, the tonsils, the <clears throat> have been removed, but we can still appreciate the arches forming. The two arches that you need to know are the number one, palatopharyngeus arch, from the palate to the pharynx, that would be this arch right over here, and the arch in the front. The arch in the front is simply known as palatoglossal arch. And here we have the attachment of the palatoglossal arch. And they're made respectively by the platofringes and platoglossal muscles. It is between these two arches that you have the tonsillar bed. Mostly the bed is formed by the superior constrictor muscle. And over here rest the tonsils. Among other structures, such as the external palatine vein, glossopharyngeal nerve. In front is a very easily appreciable tongue. But you must be careful that there are actually two parts of the musculature of the tongue. The intrinsic musculature, which can be found more superiorly, and forms the uh, basically shape-changing movement of the tongue. The otherwise other actions such as protrusion, retraction, elevation, depression, those are formed by all the other muscles and there are a host of them. The ones you can see here are genoglossus and hyoglossus. Here we have the hyoglossus, here we have the genoglossus. The genoglossus down below, right over here. And the one over here is the hyoglossus. It's easier to remember these muscles if you remember the name. They're going to the tongue, so obviously the last part will be glossus. From the hyoid to hyoglossus, from the genoid tubercle of the mandible, the genoglossus. If we were to go back, now I'm going to remove certain of these pins so that the rest of the thing would be more appreciable for you. Moving all the pins from the arches, over here, right behind the tongue, the posterior one third of the tongue, you have this sort of angle. This is the vellicula. And uh, along with the vellicula, if I were to look at the side, right over here, this is your piriform fossa. The piriform fossa and the vellicula, both, these are sites are notorious for having the lodgement of external objects such as fish bones or small pieces of sharp objects. So, and you can see how it's very easy for anything to get caught in there. Just like this is a fish bone being stuck in there. Obviously it's not going to be that big, but these are sites which are more likely to be impacted by these objects. The piriform fossa and the vellicula. The rest of the structure on the back, this cartilaginous structure, this is your epiglottis. And the epiglottis, as you see, extends all the way to the bottom right here, where you have the inlet of the larynx. Keep in mind, the back side, this is your esophagus. Here it is reaching the stomach, and here you have the larynx, which is entering into the trachea and lungs. So the epiglottis is right over here. When I enter the epiglottis, there are certain ligaments which are not that easily appreciable, but if I were to show you one of them, the one coming from the higher bone to the epiglottis, from the front, if this is your higher bone, I'm basically moving these strap muscles, this bony part right here, right above, it's not that really prominent here, but from there till this epiglottis, this is your hyoepiglottic fold, it's made by the hyoepiglottic ligament. Then finally we enter into the larynx and in the larynx you can see a very nice opening in the center where you have the vocal cords. This right over here is your vocal cord. Keep in mind, the one fold on the top is the vestibular fold, the one on the bottom is the vocal fold. This is your true vocal fold, this is your false vocal cord. Here we have the vocal cords. And now remember they are two in number, we are looking at only one half. But the space up above and between the vestibular fold and vocal fold, that space is known as the ventricle right here. In some books it might have even called as a vestibule, but this is a space in between them. Up above 
any of this area is all supplied by the superior engine nerve. Below you have the inferior engine nerve, a branch of the recurrent engine nerves. So the etiology of the damage here is different due to the nerve supply. All of this is your larynx becoming your trachea. You're finally entering into the trachea and uh, you can even appreciate a bit of the cricoid and thyroid in front. So to remove all of these strap muscles, this right over here is your thyroid cartilage. A very nice thyroid cartilage and right below it the cricoid. The ligament in between them, that ligament, so cricothyroid ligament, this one right over here. And you may have noticed, some of you, there's a muscle overlying the thyroid. This is basically your thyrohyoid muscle. Beyond that, let's come to the back side. We have done the larynx and the trachea, even done the tongue and all the structures behind. Let's remove all these pins just to clear up the region. And now let's go back to the esophagus. A few things are left to mention over there. Over here, as I said, from the pharynx, we have the entry into the esophagus and into the larynx. The back side of this esophagus, as you can see here, well, before it becomes the esophagus, here is still the pharynx. At this point, it will become the esophagus. And you can see how it becomes very muscular tube-like. At this point, it is still pharyngeal muscles. And this muscle you see right here is the superior constrictor muscle. It will blend nicely with the middle one and inferior one before finally meeting with cricopharyngeus and becoming esophagus. So here I'm putting one in the superior constrictor muscle. If we were to avert it on the back side, you can see there's a whole region exposed here. All of this is the vertebras, the cervical vertebra. The topmost you see over here, and since this is bony, it's going to be hard to put a pin through it. But the topmost, right below the basilar part of the ospital bone, that is your atlas. And the one below that is the dens of the second vertebra. And the vertebra continue downwards. The back side is still the spinal canal where you have the spinal cord. All of this fascia you see right here behind the constrictor muscles. All is this, the buccopharyngeal fascia. The buccopharyngeal fascia, if I were to remove this, and it's quite difficult to remove, it's quite thin, there's a space right behind that known as the retropharyngeal space. This retropharyngeal space is quite important because any sort of penetration through this muscle and this fascia can cause a pathway into this space. And this space can obviously get infected and an abscess can form, a retropharyngeal abscess. Commonly, you will see this in cases of fishbone impaction. With that said, we have covered the majority of the medial side of the head and neck, the sagittal section. I won't go into much details of the outer side, although there are a few notable things to see here. But as you can see that uh, a lot of these structures are pretty mangled actually. It's still quite usable. I mean, there's still certain things that we can nicely appreciate here. For example, you can still see the outside of the tongue and below that, the submandibular gland. You can see a very nice man uh, mandibular nerve dividing into a lingual nerve and a inferior lingual nerve. In fact, let me divide this to show you. Here you can see this nerve coming from the foramen ovale. I'm about to remove this muscle right here. And you can see how this nerve is coming from the foramen ovale and dividing into a lingual nerve in front and inferior alveolar nerve which goes into the jaws below. Beyond that, you can see the jugular veins and the common carotid artery and all the strap muscles. We'll do all of these features in a different specimen next time. For now, this should be so enough to help you with your OSPI. Thank you so much for joining us. Until next time then.